This video was sponsored by NVIDIA and eBuyer. Click the link in the description to check out the range of graphics cards which made this video possible. Hi guys, Mr. Off Waffles here. The year is 1997. The Titanic had just come out and generated a billion dollars in box office revenue. Tony Blair had been elected Prime Minister in the UK. Most of you probably don't even remember who that is. And I was a teeny tiny toddler who'd only just learned to walk. Life was going well. And at the end of the year, on December 9th, id Software released their new game, Quake 2. And now, 7,902 days later, I'm here recording a video about Quake 2. So why did I wait so long and what's all the fuss about? This year, Microsoft and Sony both started dropping hints about the future of their next generation consoles. And while we don't have official names just yet for the Xbox Scarlet and PS5, we do have an idea of some of the specs that they're going to support. And alongside some of the more obvious upgrades that are easy to understand, like 8K support, higher frame rates, the inclusion of an SSD, things like that, ray tracing support was also announced for both of them. Now this might at first sound just like another fancy lighting term like ambient occlusion or global illumination, but it isn't, okay? It fundamentally changes the way games look, and so NVIDIA have brought ray tracing to Quake 2 to show just how big an impact it can have on any game world. As you can see, compared to the old original Quake 2 footage, the lighting here is much more dynamic. For example, as I shoot, the the room lights up in a completely different way to how it did previously, and different surfaces that are made of different materials also interact with light differently. I think that it's instantly quite clear when you start to look at some of these reflections and things like that, that this isn't really something that we've seen properly executed in games before. I think it looks great. And to be honest, it gets even more interesting and exciting as well when you start to learn a little bit about what's actually happening here and the technology at work. Prior to now, games have always relied on a technique called rasterization to bring an image to your eyeballs. And the starting point of that is to basically create the 3D world in a kind of mesh made of polygons, which are most often triangles. This 3D world then needs to be converted into an image that can be displayed on your 2D monitor. And so the scene is transposed to 2D and rasterized in combination with things like textures, shaders, and various different maps to basically make sure that your computer understands what it is that it's looking at. The image is built up pixel by pixel and each individual pixel's color can only be determined when your computer has taken into account things like depth in the image, distance from potential light sources, and plenty more different aspects of what's going on in the scene. But your computer is approximating what's happening in the scene here rather than doing a physical simulation of it, which is a key difference to what happens in ray tracing. The result of this is what you see today in games. Plenty of games look fantastic, they look great, but often there's small details that just don't feel quite right. And then when you interact with them and they don't respond in the way that you expect, it can be a little bit disconcerting. One of the reasons for this is that your computer can only make so many approximations about what is going on. If you shine a light at something in a game, yeah, one side of the object will be lit up and then a shadow will be cast on the other side, but that isn't necessarily how a light is always going to interact with a given object. I mean, you've got diffusion to take into account, you've got reflections and refraction and transmission and all these different elements that can be kind of glossed over a little bit, no pun intended, if you're using a simple lighting approximation. It's worth noting that techniques like ambient occlusion obviously try and fix these mistakes essentially and add more detail into the game but even so they're making simplified approximations of what's actually happening. This can be especially apparent when looking at reflections in games. So you might see in the distance a shiny surface which seems to have a reflection of the space around it but then when you go over to the shiny surface and you block the light that would be coming from the environment and reflecting off the surface you don't change what's being reflected at all. It's just a static thing. It's basically just a 2D flat image that's being placed on the reflection to pretend to reflect the scene around you, whereas actually no dynamic technique is actually being implemented there at all. It's just baked in and it will always look like that. This is where ray tracing comes in. Rather than a lighting artist or an environment artist creating a certain area and then trying to make it look like how they assume it would be lit in real life, ray tracing creates a physical simulation of that space to tell the computer how it would really be lit. The specific version 
version of ray tracing that NVIDIA have implemented is a thing called path tracing, which is basically the purest form of ray tracing. It basically works as follows. Instead of trying to model every single photon, every single beam of light coming out of a given light source, and seeing how every single infinite one of those might interact with a scene, the paths are actually traced out of your eyeball as a player back into the space and then bounced around before being traced back to the original light source. So it's kind of a reversed way of looking at things. The reason for this is that it reduces the computational complexity massively because instead of modeling loads and loads of beams of light that don't ever even end up reaching your eyes and therefore don't end up interacting with the player's experience in any way, they can ensure that the stuff that changes how you see the world is modeled and the rest of it can be left alone. Even with that slight simplification, it's still a really intensive technique just trying to model every single bounce of the light in your scene. I mean, you've got to take so much into consideration when a single beam of light hits a certain object, you need to start thinking about, okay, is it a semi-transparent object? What's the actual material made of? Is it gonna transmit some of the light? Is it gonna be illuminated? For example, if it's a thinner material, like a leaf or a piece of paper, that might absorb some light, but then emit it to the space around it, and so it would illuminate the things that are in close proximity to it, but it also then might reflect some, and so you'd need a beam going off that's gonna be going further than just that near field kind of created by the illumination of the object, and that then needs to be modeled when that hits something and you can start to see why this is getting computationally expensive here because that beam then goes elsewhere and needs to eventually end up back at the light source because it's going from your eyeball, remember? It's going in that reversed order. And it's not like there's just one or two beams of light. There's a lot of these beams that need to be all grouped together and processed by your GPU. You might be thinking, man, that's a lot of work and I don't know if it's even really worth it. So with all of the hard work that's going into this technique, is it even really worth it? Well, if you look at the top tier film and animation studios like Disney, Pixar, and all those sorts of giant companies, they're all using these sorts of techniques. They're all using ray tracing to help light their work. And the reason for that is that it just looks more realistic and better than anything else they could do to equivalently light up their scenes. Their CGI just looks better with it in use. It's a little different in their case because they have access to massive render farms that can spend multiple days rendering single frames, and that's not an exaggeration, genuinely. It can take over a day to render one frame of CGI using the ray tracing that they're implementing. And that's another reason why I think it's so impressive that NVIDIA have got their cards into a place now where ray tracing can happen on all these different frames in your games, 30, 60 or more times per second. It's obviously still early days as well, and this is only going to get more accessible to more people as the years go by. And now that NVIDIA have kind of taken this first step and brought it to consumers, I think that there's going to be more demand for it too, which is only going to accelerate that process. This brings me back to Quake. So obviously, Quake 2 isn't the most amazing looking game in the world, but I think that you can agree it's a good kind of test bench to show exactly how this technique is transforming a space around you as a player in a game, and be a kind of proof of concept to say, if it can do this to Quake 2, imagine what it could do in some of your other favorite games. I mean, I know that some people have already tried out doing little experiments with ray tracing in Minecraft, for example which is a game which would look absolutely incredible if NVIDIA were able to bring their path tracing, ray tracing technology to it. I mean, just think about it. If you've got light that is spilling around a block and then you place the block and it changes the way that the light is being cast inside your house or through glass or through all these different materials, it would just look so damn good. So that's one game that I'm really hoping will end up with this technology being implemented in some point in the future. But there are swathes of other games out there too that are just as good candidates for it. I mean, leave a comment down below with your favorite game maybe that you think this would be a really good addition to bring to. The fact that it's going to start being more popular in next generation consoles and things like that as well, it's going to start being possible for more and more people to get their hands on this tech, is going to mean that game devs are going to be able to start thinking differently about the way they actually design in the first place. There's obviously a need for them to focus a little bit more on what a material is actually made of, what the properties of that material 
material actually are, rather than just making a flat material with a texture on it and then saying, yeah, the light is done by a completely different person in the studio and it's a separate kind of part of the design loop entirely. Now, game devs might be able to take these reflections into account and the way that this lighting works in their design for the gameplay itself. So as a random example, let's say you're playing a game based on Greek myth and you're Perseus trying to slay Medusa. Medusa is a Gorgon. If you look her in the eyes, you get turned to stone. And so what Perseus ingeniously does is polish his shield and then look in its reflection to see around corners and things like that to make sure that it's safe for him to go and get close to Medusa and then take her down. And if you were playing a game that relied on a similar concept where you had a little reflective surface that you could pull out and look around corners and things like that, that would undoubtedly be so much more accurate and so much better implemented if ray tracing was added to that game, to that experience. Similarly, games that are more competitive. If your lighting is dynamic enough such that you can tell the movements of enemy players in higher fidelity, that's going to mean that there's potentially going to be an even higher skill ceiling possible there because you're going to be able to make certain decisions based on just the lighting of the space rather than seeing people's movement and that being the only way that you can like track players and stuff like that. It's just exciting, man. The technology has so much potential. That's part of the reason why I wanted to make this video in collaboration with NVIDIA and eBuyer because I want people to be talking about this and getting excited about it. Like it's genuinely one of the big steps I think that are going to mean that next gen looks significantly better than current gen. I can't wait to see all the creative genius ideas that devs come up with to bring this experience to our eyeballs and change the way they're actually making their games in the first place. There are so many puns that I could drop here. The future is bright like all that sort of stuff. But I think I should probably wrap things up. So thank you so much once again to NVIDIA and eBuyer for getting involved. Like I said, link in the description down below if you want to pick up a 2080 Ti for yourself and actually do this in game. Thank you guys for watching. Hopefully this has been a kind of informative video as well as turning you on to a new kind of technique that you might not have heard of before. I've tried to get a little bit into the actual process itself and give you a little bit of... Dr. Ruffle Waffle's information on what's happening. So drop a thumbs up if you've had a good time on this one, guys. And I'll hopefully see you very soon in more future videos with RTX turned on, maybe? Okay. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I've been Mr. Ruffle Waffles. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.